but there's a board and there are working groups that run this. And it's supposed to offer uh, uh, advances for the, the, the industry as a whole, because a uh, 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 car manufacturer might all of a sudden uh, choose to, to pick another uh, vendor for, say, uh, the cruise control system. And that should work, because it's, it's using standardized interfaces and standardized semantics. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, the manufacturer <coughs> of a cruise control system, which is typically a completely different company, might also choose to go to some other uh, car manufacturers to say, hey, we have a system that you might be interested in. So it's supposed to, to, to offer some, some flexibility in the whole uh, uh, automotive industry uh, uh, ecosystem. But there are problems. Uh, as I mentioned, AutoSAR is a kind of an abstract model where uh, we talk about the structure of systems and constraints on the systems. It's supposed to be platform independent, or it, it more or less is. Uh, whereas uh, this model is supposed to be converted or uh, refined into a concrete implementation which consists of the C files and config tables that we uh, might uh, expect, and which of course is highly platform dependent. <coughs> uh, this abstract model lacks any notion of code, computation, activities. Uh, whereas on the C level we only have code. There the structure and the uh, Everything else has sort of has disappeared and become buried in, 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 in the C files. That leads to the uh, uh, the consequence is that uh, the models themselves are not executable at all. Whereas, for, in order to execute things, we need the full implementation. This particular uh, combination, the notion of platform independent execution is just non-existent. I think, and many others think, that this is a serious flaw in this, uh, this architecture. In order to, well, most likely this, consequences are that you can't really uh, test an AutoSAR model as such until you have done all your implementation steps you have made sure all your other subsystems are present. And until you have committed to a particular tool, a particular platform, a particular compiler, a particular set of libraries, a particular um, configuration management, management uh, uh, application, runtime environment generation application, there's a whole bunch of things that constitute a particular platform within this standard. And you need to commit to that before you can even test a single subsystem. So you can't really talk about an AutoSAR model in the abstract. You can't really talk about black box AutoSAR behavior, simply because it's not there. It's like talking about Haskell without a semantics with only the assembly code that results in the end as your guiding light when, uh, when we want to distinguish or reason about what, what, uh, what our program files mean. So this is clearly uh, clearly uh, not very uh, not very nice. <laughs> At Chalmers, we we are running a project called Raw FP. It's called uh, Resource-aware functional programming is essentially about exploring domain-specific languages within Haskell in an industrial setting. So the theme is that we can use semantics-based analysis <coughs> in the verification of Haskell because it's an abstract high-level language that we know and love. But we can also achieve efficient execution after we compile our embedded domain-specific languages to the preferred target. It's about uh, trying to, 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 to uh, bridge this gap 
not executing Haskell directly on the platforms, but using Haskell as a framework for defining device, domain-specific languages that inherit Haskell features, but which we can also compile into a target-specific code, for example, that run uh, in the other side. So one of our validator tracks is precisely about that, defining an AutoSAR, DS, uh, AutoSAR software component DSL. And that DSL is uh, meant to contain structure and constraint from what you typically define in AutoSAR editors and code, because Haskell is all about uh, expressing code. But in order to do this, we need to know, <coughs> we need to somehow find out what does uh, an RSR model mean. We need to somehow reverse engineer the semantics from these 12 and a half thousand pages. Of course, informally, you have semantics, and also in practice, when you have a complex specification of something, what do people do? Well, you try it out, you experiment with it. People experiment with their con concrete platforms, but we would like to offer an embedded DSL with uh, which you can make your experiments without committing to a particular platform, to a particular uh, hardware architecture, uh, without committing to a particular uh, complete environment. You should be able to experiment running uh, arbitrary subsystems in a platform. So, RSR semantics, what do we mean? Well, here's a, a, a silly picture that tries to depict that. We want to say that an RSR system, whatever it is, might behave in a certain manner, evolve or execute or uh, uh, change in a certain manner. There is no determinism involved, so it might change in another manner as well. But there are certain behaviors that we don't expect to see, which are sort of illegal according to the standard. We want to define what this is. And of course, the natural thing to do is to, to uh, talk about behaviors as traces that are sequences of transitions between system states. And uh, semantics is then the set of possible traces that you can uh, see starting from the initial state of a particular system. So what is the initial state of a particular system? Well, honest, our tools usually try to use graphics to depict systems. So you have uh, components that are uh, uh, containers of runnables, code fragments that is, interrunnable variables that some shared state, um, <laughs> exclusive areas that are essentially semaphores, uh, ports, and connections between ways. And to this, you typically also see uh, some additional annotations and constraints uh, supplied in various uh, uh, ways. What we uh, have uh, chosen to do is to just try to capture this first, first as a kind of a, a, a semantics and then an implementation in, in, in Haskell. So what I'm going to show you, you now, a couple of slides, is what we call the semantics of RSI. We start by just making textual terms from these uh, elements you saw on the, on the slide, uh, the picture. We use a kind of hierarchical naming scheme so that we uh, name every uh, every entity in such a way that it's clear from in, in which component, in which context it is defined, we get globally valid names. And these are uh, just textual terms that are supposed to exist in parallel. They, they, uh, their parallel composition is a kind of a big process that we want to, uh, to uh, talk about, how, how it evolves. And then we have uh, also uh, some uh, constant facts that we extract from these structures. Uh, for example, the connections, the initial values. Uh, 
To that, we also add the runnable instances, because in Autos, our runnables are just uh, templates from which you instantiate instances, uh, just like the difference between programs and processes, in, in, or classes and objects in, in other, in other uh, uh, contexts. And since we also want to talk about the code, we add facts that says that uh, for a particular runnable, the code looks uh, like this and that. Which, uh, you should know, is not part of the Autosar standard. This is left open until you have moved <coughs> into some C coding for the runnables. We want to do that by finding some more abstract definition or abstract representation. And then, if we have atoms, as you saw on the previous page, we define uh, transitions between the atoms. Here's an atom that can say A, comma, L, whatever that means. Here's another atom that can hear this. And we have chosen to, to use a kind of broadcast-like process calculus approach, where one process can say something, the other process is terms here, that very thing, and together they form uh, a compound transition, a compound process transition into uh, the new compound state that uh, is marked with the same label. There's also non-determinism involved in the sense that it's not always given who is able to speak. Many processes might be able to speak in a certain context and it's non-deterministic which one is chosen. And that is because autos are embodies non-deterministic. So what about code? Uh, a runnable instance, what will it do? Well, it will be triggered by some event. It will execute some internal computations. And then at certain places, it will perform uh, RTE calls, runtime environment calls. These calls are sequential and observable, whereas the internal computations are, uh, are required to be side effects per call. Very interesting. And in particular, they cannot access global memory. Not read, not write global memory. You only, a runnable is only uh, allowed to interact via, with others via the, the RT calls. That's quite interesting. And also, the runnable is supposed to terminate. Uh, we uh, can uh, formulate that as some kind of you know, textual way. Here's an example or, or a subset of the RT operation that you uh, might see. Uh, asynchronous send and receive, uh, synchronous call, write and read, shared state, acquire and release a log. And a few more. We will also uh, model this as uh, uh, with a slight extension, extension where we use continuations to just talk about what comes next. Eventually, a uh, runnable returns a value that it returns. So, with this uh, machinery, we can define some simple axioms for how Autosar components and Autosar. Uh, atoms behave. We can say that a runnable instance whose code is executing an, an enter operation, it will say enter and also what exclusive area it wants to enter. And then uh, continue with the continuation. Uh, it can do the same when it wants to execute an exit. An exclusive area on the other hand, which is all, uh, another atomic component, can uh, hear that somebody wants to enter it, and then switch to the take it state, from the free state to the take it state, and exit it. So if you combine this, if you have two processes that want to enter uh, uh, an exclusive area and one shared exclusive area, you can have this transition where process one 
wins. Or you can have this transition where process 2 wins, but you cannot, and this is formally provable, that you cannot have this transition where both win. Very simple example of what you can do, what you can express with this kind of uh, process calculus like semantics <coughs> that we have defined for us. You might think of well, entering exclusive areas. This is <coughs> mutex acquisition, like the semantics of semaphores. How complicated can it be? Well, here are some excerpts from the Autosar standard. It's even this simple part of Autosar is quite confusing. The RTE is not required to support nested invocations of RTE exit for the same exclusive area. Okay? But is it allowed? Well, how, how should a system treat a runnable that tries to nest its uh, exit operations to the same area? Not clear from the specification. And also, Requirement blah 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 permits calls to RT enter and RT exit to be nested as long as different exclusive areas are exited in the reverse order they are entered. Okay? It's permitted if the code does in a certain way. But what if the code does not? What should happen? Should you get an error back? Should you crash? Should you uh, uh, block? What should happen? No. So in our work, we have had to just make some uh, clever assumptions and make definitions. We'll try to, to, to uh, uh, concretize what all this means. And we've ended up, ended up with, uh, we would like to feed this back to the Autosar community and, 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 and start a discussion. What, what do these things do? Because they probably differ between different uh, Autosar but this one, uh, it says we must, uh, we cannot, if we uh, try to uh, exit from an area that we have already exited, exited from a uh, system <coughs> that gets blocked, which is equivalent of, of uh, uh, an exception in this uh, scenario. And we also require specifically the same reverse order because here we uh, keep track of what exclusive areas we actually have, and they must be a certain order. This is the append operator, or sequence, sequence operator. One might ask, though, is it really necessary to enforce this sequential constraint? Because sequential ordering of exclusive areas and, uh, um, are, is usually there to uh, prevent deadlock. But that requires everybody to follow the same order. That's not a requirement in our so <coughs> Deadlock isn't mentioned in the specification. So, uh, here, I, I will skip over some, uh, very quickly, uh, some other interesting, or semi-interesting uh, definitions. Spawning runnables runnable instances. When you hear something that has some data arriving on a port, you can uh, go into the pending state. And if you're in the pending state, you can spawn a runnable instance with your code and go back to the idle state. That's what this says. One bit of information keeps track of us. That leads to the following. And this is, uh, we believe, quite accurate. This is what the, the specification says, but it's rather strange. You can have a situation where a runnable receives two uh, or triggers on two received data elements that are put in a queue. Here uh, one and here two. And then triggers two runnable instances, two instances of itself to handle those two elements. But the semantics also allows this schedule where you only trigger one because you spoke the order. You don't, uh, uh, if you don't uh, uh, 
if you don't store an instance between the first and the second arrival, then you'll lose information that there are actually two elements in the queue. And you'll end up with one instance. A rather tricky uh, behavior of a concurrent system that's supposed to be event driven. We have some more uh, notion, uh, some special transition of uh, passing time because the other specification says that you can uh, dictate that a runnable is not allowed to spawn instances of itself uh, uh, very close to what it, uh, if it has <coughs> done so just recently. So there is a, uh, a delay in between. In practice, this means that what the transitions, uh, the traces that we see, will contain, contain work steps and aging steps, where uh, the relationship in our semantics is not really uh, restricted. It means that you can do a lot of work and then age a millisecond, and then do a lot of work and then age a microsecond. The relationship between the time steps and the amount of work is not restricted. So that means that the semantics really gives you the behavior of an arbitrarily fast plan. The full, full problem of giving semantics to uh, others are on a specific platform is finding out whether the platform is powerful enough to actually uh, include any of the traces in the semantics, uh, the platform independent semantics. You might wonder why have we chosen this notation. Well, it was just because it's probable. I will talk about Haskell very soon. But uh, Prolog turns out to be a rather nice notation for, for defining these kind of logic relations that constitute a, a process calculus or a transition system. It wouldn't be as convenient to dis define this in Haskell directly because it wouldn't, it wouldn't be directly executable in the way that we, well, that we want. Of course, our DSL implementation will do you know, that exactly, but it doesn't look as succinct as it does. We have to uh, be wary though, because standard follow-up does not have higher order functions in these features. But apart from that, and careful ordering of predicates, it's, it's quite good for doing exhaustive searches of single view transition, really finding out can this happen or can this not. You might want, is it a good format for communicating semantic, semantic detail? We would like to engage in RSR community people in these discussions. And this notation is as close to a, a common format for semantic discussions as we could come. Uh, if you have any suggestions for what to use instead, please, please tell me. Did you consider uh, PLT Redex? Uh, no, we did not, simply because uh, we haven't really played with it. But we should. But the, the problem is not only whether we like it. The problem is whether the community of Autosar, uh, Autosar uh, people or Autosar standards, uh, people did involved in the, defining the standard like it. Well, it's no worse than this. Uh, I'll, I'll take a look. <laughs> So have you talked to the other people already? Uh, yeah, I talked to them. Uh, I've worked with them in a couple of, of projects that, that concern the, the tiny extension of Autosar. And, and it's uh, kind of a community. Uh, but there are many, uh, uh, many bridges to cross before you can get a common understanding of semantic issues. But no, uh, that's a side, uh, side discu uh, discussion. Uh, okay, uh, this is uh, for the semantic foundation, which we must so somehow define. Uh, but what I really wanted to talk about is the Haskell DSL that results. So it's a DSL that allows <coughs> us to embed Haskell computation <coughs> inside all of them. But also, because of this embedding, uh, 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 magic. 
it allows us to embed other SAR computations or simulations, if you like, inside the ordinary Haskell, which is great. I will show you. We use monads. Here's uh, the monad of RTE, uh, the, the runtime environment API. Don't expect you to to uh, make it, uh, interpret and make any sense of this. Apart from here, you see the, the operations that we can do. Enter and exit, read and write shared variables, send and receive uh, from queued data, read and write non-queued data, call required uh, uh, call uh, synchronous uh, service operations. And the ports that we use, they have rather uh, explicit names that allow us to uh, uh, Follow the AutoSAR standard uh, requirement that reports are of all different kinds. So this is what for, C? Sorry, what's ah, C? that's a, a ghost type variable for keeping track of which component we are. I will show, uh, shortly show you how uh, that is used. Here is the other monad. We, we use two monads. One for defining the runtime environment that shows what, what, what uh, effects the computations of a runner we have. Here's the monad for constructing uh, a, uh, AutoSAR components themselves. The structure, the hierarchical building of components and their runnables and the ports and the connections and so forth. And here you see uh, the type that quantifies over all components C. This is what we use in order to encapsulate a component and its private uh, ports and variables inside uh, a shield that is not accessible from the outside. It's the standard run ST trick, if, you're, if you know that from us. So uh, the details here are not important either. <laughs> Just that, uh, except that we have many different operations for creating ports of different kinds. Autos are distinguished between the required ports and the provided ports, and connections are supposed to connect required and, uh, and uh, provided ports. Here's a simple example we have two components, uh, two runables in each. Uh, synchronous and asynchronous communication in between them, some timers, and so on. Here's the structure captured in our DSL, and here's uh, some templates for filling in what, what compu uh, computations we might want to add. Reading and writing, of course. <coughs> don't expect, uh, uh, I don't want to go into the details, I just want to draw your what? What this corresponds to an actual AutoSAR? Is this usually a bunch of C code? Or uh, this part, yes, that's actually my next slide. Compared to the traditional way of, of uh, capturing an AutoSAR system, where you typically write this in a graphical editor, and then you write C code using a lot of macros that are special, especially, specifically generated from your, uh, uh, your graphical editor, you write C code like this, and then you also have to fill out some extra code where you do the task mapping that, for some magic reason, is part of the AutoSAR standard, but which is not really necessary if you define a real time semantic. Uh, here you map uh, runnables to tasks depending on how often they will run. For example, B2 and A2 could run in the same operating system. But operating system tasks it is not uh, an AutoSAR uh, uh, feature. It, it's not a part of the AutoSAR model itself. So it's uh, rather confusing. It's just that <coughs> you should also be aware that the graphical model itself is actually, this is not a joke. This is the exact correspondence in XML to what the previous graphical Oh, this is only for describing that simple structure. 
So imagine trying to define the semantics directly on this syntax, which is what we have. What we can capture with, uh, with types is, of course, a lot of misuse of, uh, of, of the port features connecting two required ports to each other, for example, or uh, mismatching uh, the type contents. That's uh, quite simple, but it requires an extra analysis in, in the other side world. We can also distinguish between uh, uh, the runnables that <coughs> correspond to uh, synchronous operations because Autosar specifies that they take parameters and uh, return results. We cannot do this, for example, because this runnable doesn't take it. And here's the uh, run SD trick. We cannot let a local variable that we have kept encapsulated inside uh, a component to escape and be used somewhere uh, from, from the outside. It's captured in the type system. I would like to uh, show a quick demo before we finish off. Here's an ABS system. We have actually used this for, for, for implementing a little, uh, a slightly bigger example. It's non trivial. It's an ABS system, uh, four-wheel controllers. Uh, it reads velocities and accelerations uh, from uh, sensors, and it produces valve open-close signals for pressure and release valves for the individual, individual wheels. This corresponds to uh, these fragments. Quite comprehensive, if I may say so. Some, uh, the AR monad defines the structure of the system. Uh, the RTE monad defines the code inside runables. This is the full system, but it's not incredibly big. Uh, here we do a trick that has to do with, we want to export ports for uh, the ability to connect them, but we don't want to uh, export the ability to read and write them outside the components do that by a seal operation, which oh, is as close to the ideal as we have gotten. One could discuss if we could find an alternative operation. Anyway, uh, here's another part, the wheel controller. And uh, what we can do, so we, uh, we define the wheel controller, define the subcomponents, we connect the ports using these operations, and we can also add probes to it that are only for the simulation, where we want to uh, have a look at runtime and see what is happening. We can convert to doubles if we want to. Uh, well, uh, one variant of, of this code is actually requiring the probes to be double bound, but uh, you know. uh, so, uh, and if you want to simulate an ABS system like this, you would ideally want some kind of mature model of your physical car as well. So we are working currently on achieving this, integrating our simulator with Simulink, where you could run uh, the physics of the car. But currently, we have to stick with this, a simulated car as an auto source system of its own, which isn't as fashionable. But we can wrap it in uh, as a uh, closed component that is only uh, going to export what, what it uh, does via the probes that we define. And here is what this, oh, it doesn't show. Uh, what the main, uh, the main uh, function does. It defines uh, XX simulator random scheduling, and here is the test component. We limit the time to five seconds over here. We print the logs. Uh, on the standard I.O., and then we make a plot of the whole trace. So we get a trace back from the simulation, we print it on standard I.O., some, uh, certain parts of it, and then we plot the result. I could show you uh, in real life, but I'll skip that. Here's uh, what we get out when we plot the probes, probe results. And you can see quite easily the vehicle speed, or the speed of a chosen wheel one is this curve. Here's uh, our simple physics of the car has 
shows that uh, wheel two uh, deaccelerates too fast, which is detected by the ABS system and start, uh, which starts to closes the pressure valve, opens the relief valve, pulses it according to uh, common uh, pulse width modulation principles that are used in, in this kind of control uh, systems, and then it applies pressure again like that. And we see that uh, the speed is getting back to the wheel speed, and then something starts to happen again down here, but now we're close to, to zero speed. So this is uh, quite interesting. We, we, uh, we play with this, we can change parameters and you see different behaviors. And random scheduling, I want to come to that, is a very important part of this. Because I'm just going to show you a short example of a very simple system where you have a typical race condition. This is a simple system where every client should get a unique number. Well, that's not hard. We write something like this. Have a state that we increase for each for each uh, call. And we use that with run robin scheduling. We can, uh, we can uh, run our, our simulator with a standard round robin scheduler. And we get deterministic unique numbers. Then we skip the switch to random scheduling. And we notice that we have duplicate numbers in this, in this case. How come? Well, there is a race condition in our code because we have, remember, we have concurrent invocations. And, uh, well, I didn't really tell you about the details of concurrent invocations, but RSR is such that it uh, will run this uh, operation concurrently, unless you protect it using ex enter and exit operations. And if you forget that, well, we can discuss whether uh, AutoSAR provides a good API, but this is what our AutoSAR provides. You can actually make, easily make these mistakes. But we can uh, correct it by uh, entering, uh, adding these features, and now we run it with the corrected uh, term, we see that uh, it's still random. The numbers aren't really returned in, in um, with, uh, deterministic order, but they are really. Let me uh, finish by showing you what uh, we aim to do. What we currently can do, we can manually construct our systems in our DSL, and we can run them in the simulator and observe the output. We are also working on the alternative of compiling the output to the C and XML formats that existing AutoSAR tool chains accept, so that we could actually run them on real hardware, so that it, would, it wouldn't just be a, 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 a toy. Once we have that, we can start playing with optimization and refactoring and, 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 and things like that. And playing, you know, programming in Haskell is actually quite convenient compared to the C and XML world that RSR lives in. And we can even think about doing a kind of a decompilation where we try to extract info from the subset of, of the RSR, the uh, standard RSR forms. This is what we have. Uh, we cover in the semantics and in the DSL the application and composition software Sender and receiver, client server ports. Exclusive errors into runnable variables. <coughs> we capture the real time behavior of uh, an arbitrary test file. This is what we would like to add. Some things are trivial, some are much more uh, interesting, but probably not hard. The, the framework we have started to use is quite, uh, quite uh, convenient. But we also end up in, uh, in questions. Certain things are just not applicable. The task assignment phase, the data type mapping, the, the, the RTE generation phase that RSR talks about as a kind of a poor man's alternative to a poor man's analysis. We don't want to capture that. But on the other hand, if we don't, we might have problems uh, uh, 
decompiling certain systems. So here are my takeaway bullets. If you have a platform independent standard, you should also offer the option to do platform independent testing and simulation. I think you can experiment with, uh, with uh, uh, OS X or, or Android simply because it's tangible. But if you have only have a standard, you need to offer a platform independent tool for experimentation because people will not read your, your standard documents anymore. Random scheduling is really uh, a real win. Having the ability to randomly schedule your, um, your uh, concurrent system would catch a lot of bugs. Haskell can be useful for even embedded automotive programming, programming by our DSL. You don't need to run Haskell in the car. The, the, the cars we run with, uh, in our simulator and then we compile. Our final thing. Others are runnables restrict the way that uh, you can use side effects. In fact, we discovered they do it in a way that is really the <coughs> concretization of a Haskell monad. It's a beautiful discovery. Autosar describes a Haskell monad in their runnable, uh, for the other runnables. I think that's my, my, my uh, last remark. So thank you for, for listening. Thank you. So, any real quick questions? Left? I don't know if it's quick, but <clears throat> so you um, restricted the standard further. You added some rules that are not going to be obeyed by every Autosar component out there. Uh, you can see if I evolved the. Uh, Elaborate on the semantics if I ask. Yes, yes, the semantics is stricter than the original standard. Well, uh, we wanted to be very, it, we wanted to capture the original standard, but we don't uh, support all features currently. Uh, so, this we support currently. This I think we can support with some work. But what's up there is sort of it. It's not just that it's hard, it, it's, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. But there's all, I don't, know, I don't know if I got this completely wrong, but I expect that, that some components that are written in Autosar C uh, will not interoperate with the uh, software that is generated by the abstract semantics. That is probably right, yes. Um, and then the, just because of this. Yes, and then the other components will reason that the Autosar standard is obeyed because they don't do anything that's forbidden by the standard, it's just forbidden by the semantics. And then, yeah. well, do you expect a lot of problems? I don't think that will be any worse than it is because currently people don't really care about semantics. They, they, they just expect things to, to, to clash and then spend half a year trying to resolve these, these clashes. But in that case, you will have to either change the generated code by hand to, to work with the other component, or if means that people who build the other component change their code even though they or obey the standard. We have to find ways to, to, to adapt. I mean, we are not going to say standard. to change the world. We just want to capture what, what, what the standard tries to say. Uh, yeah. One final question. And uh, you said you uh, need to your what is some of that to simulate and test mm -hmm. the code? Have you also thought about uh, using, about applying other interpretations, like to statically analyze, <coughs> analyze uh, all of our code? We, we have Check statically uh, that there are no race conditions, for example. It's a very, a very good opportunity. We haven't done any work there. We certainly have thought about it, but we haven't done it mm -hmm. yet. But it's, uh, it's waiting to be explored. Thank you for answering the questions. Thank you.